Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And And this this is is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised, as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Hey, Stormy, do you know what my last job was? Um, no. It's a can crusher. It was so depressing. Oh, my God. (laughs) Boy, I really, oh, my God. That's so funny. (laughs) It was so depressing. If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. Hey guys, and welcome back. So for part two, we're going to pick up where we left off with Brittany's case. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you should pause here and go back to listen so the following events make a bit more sense. If you have listened to part one, here's a reminder on where we left off. Brittany had been communicating with various friends throughout the evening of May 30th until about 10.45 p.m. Around 11.20, two texts are sent from her phone, and at 12.07, her phone is used to check her voicemail. Around that same time, Donnie heads back to Mobile, and then an outgoing text is sent from Brittany's phone from around the Grand Bay area at 1.47 a.m. on May 31st. And that was the last activity of any kind from Brittany, or her phone at least. And I think, Stormy, we had talked about how no one seems to have any knowledge about what happened to Brittany or where she is. I mean, I'm not even sure I've ever heard anyone step up to say, at least publicly, yeah, I spoke to her that night. Right. From what we can tell, not even the friends she had been communicating with that evening have claimed to know anything. The one person that would know for sure would be Donnie, of course. But less than 48 hours later, he's found with an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Ultimately, he died from the injuries and was never able to tell anyone about those hours he spent with Brittany. Now, keep in mind that up until this point, Brittany's family believed she had left on May 30th going to Courtney's home. And just to fill in May 31st for Brittany, it looks like There were a few incoming calls and texts, but not many. And kind of surprisingly, a couple of those calls were from Donnie. Of course, none of those calls or texts were answered, and there's no location information available for Brittany's phone after that Grand Bay ping. So it wasn't until the family started trying to call Brittany on June 1st to let her know what happened to Donnie that they actually began to suspect something was wrong. When Brittany wouldn't answer, Chessie said she called Courtney, and then she found out that Brittany had not been at her house at all and had never planned to go to her house, but actually had went to Donnie's instead. So, given the timing of when Brittany's family first learned she was not with Courtney and that Chessie says in the documentary they didn't learn about the messages Brittany received from her cousin until after the fact, I guess the idea that Brittany left with Donnie to confront him was something that also came up later. Supposedly, Brittany's cell phone was found in Donnie's SUV, so it's necessary to take a little detour here and discuss what Donnie's activities were leading up to this. Yeah. 
There's a lot there. There's a lot, a lot. I think probably one of the things that's most surprising about Donnie's death, for the public anyway, was that Brittany's gun, or purportedly Brittany's gun, was found in Donnie's SUV. But I think, now that we've looked at this, there's some really interesting things leading up to this point. Or at least, well, maybe not leading up to it, but the day of, that people haven't necessarily looked at. And that maybe his death, and the questions behind that, could potentially be the thread that unravels everything. I agree. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess keeping in mind that Donnie's phone had no activity between 1.28 a.m. and 8.33 a.m. on May 31st, there's no location information. We only know that he was at least back at the Sticks River property by 8.33 a.m. on May 31st. Between 8.33 a.m. and 9.30 a.m., it looks like Donnie sent eight texts to Brittany, which, of course, weren't answered. Between noon and 7.06 p.m., Donnie called Brittany four times. And I'm assuming this is because she wasn't answering texts or calls. So you take all that into consideration with all that we know now. (laughs) This is just kind of complicating things even more, trying to figure out what the heck was going on with Donnie. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of attempts to contact someone who isn't responding. And you're the last person to have been known to see them. Right. And, you know, granted, at this point, maybe it wasn't known that he was the last person to have seen her. But I think you can look at that in a couple of ways. Either Donnie knew Brittany was potentially in harm's way when he last saw her and was concerned, or he was working to create an alibi. You know, if he knew what happened and knew that Brittany was not going to be answering, then at least law enforcement would see the calls in the phone log and it would be easier for him to say, I didn't know anything had happened to her. You know, I've been trying to call her. Right, right. That would be great. I would buy. (laughs) Then again, if Brittany was actually with him when he came back to Mobile and he dropped her off with someone somewhere, maybe he truly didn't know what happened. And was just, you know, checking to make sure she was okay. I don't necessarily think that's what happened, but it's a possibility. Right. And, of course, in a case like this, you do have to look at all the angles, especially since it's not known for certain whether that last message from Brittany's phone was actually a repeat text. Yeah, I mean, it could have been somebody who had her phone and thought, let me send this message, you know, to the last person she talked to. Um, It would have been nice if her phone had been recovered to settle that, but it wasn't. So here we are. Right. Someone knows where that phone is. I'd almost be willing to bet there's a few someones who know that. Someones who could still talk even. Yeah. I wonder who those could be. I have some ideas. So back to Donnie's activities. Our understanding is Wendy and their children spent the night with Donnie at the Sticks River property on May 31st, and he took them to Jennifer's the following morning. Well, we get that understanding Hmm. from hearsay, essentially. Um, You know, we don't, like we said, we don't have other cell phone records to prove that, but You just kind of have to go with what you got. But that's Mm. the story, you know, as of now. I mean, I haven't heard any different of you. No, I haven't heard anything different. I mean, we check up on this pretty often because this is just a crazy ongoing case. Right. So we know from Donnie's phone records that on the morning of June 1st, he started making phone calls around 8.21 a.m., And at 9.41, he sends two texts to Brittany. It seems to be his last attempt at getting in touch with her. Maybe the fact that she still hadn't responded to the previous text and phone calls and didn't respond to the two text messages he sent that morning sent him spiraling downhill. I mean, maybe he knew if he didn't already that 
Brittany wasn't going to be responding. If you take that in conjunction with the fact that he had a meeting scheduled with Winberg that day, that seems pretty likely. According to location data, Donnie was at or near the Sticks River property until at least 941. There's no activity on his phone between 941 and 1041, so there's also no location data. So essentially, it looks like he sent the two messages to Brittany, then turns his phone off. Well, we're assuming anyway. Then from 1041 a.m. to 1125 a.m., all incoming calls are forwarded to voicemail, with the exception of one outgoing call at 1054. Location information we've seen indicates that he was at or near Jennifer and Will Moore's home in Magnolia Springs at the time that call was made. Okay, so to be clear, the Jennifer that Chessie refers to in the docuseries is the same Jennifer Gonzalez Moore that owned the Sticks River property at the time, one and the same as the Jennifer Moore that was arrested in the sex room. That's right. Donnie's phone is again turned off, I'm guessing, because all calls received between 10.54 and 11.23 a.m. go to voicemail. There doesn't appear to be any location information, again, but between 11.25 and 11.29, Donnie calls Wendy, at which point Donnie's phone pings off a tower near Karen Court. This is where his phone remains until after he's found and medical personnel remove him from the scene. And remember, Donnie and Wendy's family home was on Bay Street in Fairhope because this is going to be important in a moment. Yep. From 1132 to 1134, Donnie's phone calls are again sent to voicemail. At 1135, Donnie receives a phone call from Wendy. During this call, an incoming call from Jennifer is sent to voicemail. Which is odd because Wendy and Jennifer are supposed to be together at this point. So wouldn't Jennifer have known that Wendy was on the phone with him? You would think so. Unless they dropped the kids off at Jennifer and Wendy actually left with Donnie, maybe? Maybe he took her to the Fairhope house on Bay Street and left from there. And that's a good theory, so hold on to that for a second, because we've got something that maybe supports that. Between 11.39 and 11.42, Wilmore, Jennifer's husband, calls Donnie several times, but Donnie only answers one of those calls. From 11.41 to 2.15-ish, there are no outgoing calls or texts from Donnie's phone, and all incoming calls are either unanswered or forwarded to voicemail. A few things of interest happen during this time frame. One, BCSO calls Donnie twice, once at 11.46 and once at 11.50. Next, Fairhope Police Department creates an incident report for a possible suicide on County Road 32 at 12.02 p.m. Interesting. Yeah, keep that time frame in mind. County Road 32 intersects with River Park Road, which will all make sense in a minute. So next, the last known incoming call from Wendy is at 12.28, which is not answered. Wendy didn't call Donnie's phone again. Odd, huh? Considering this Hmm. was his wife, who was so worried about where her husband's mental status was at the time. Yeah, and Winberg said in the series that Wendy called him to report Donnie's erratic behavior that he was missing and that she was worried about him. Sure wish we had her cell phone records. Yeah, that'd be great because I would love to know who she was communicating with during this time frame, especially since she claims to have spoken with Donnie after the last phone call she made to him at 1228. Well, Donnie didn't make her answer any phone calls at all after 1146. So assuming she said that, it's just wrong. Although, did we really need any more reason to question her credibility? Not really. Especially considering from 2.15 to 2.27, multiple calls are made and received to and from Jennifer Moore on Donnie's phone 
And we know there's no possible way that Donnie made those phone calls. Nope. Because 911 received a call at 2.16 p.m. reporting a suicide attempt. 911, what's the address of your The caller name is redacted from the records, but the notes indicate it was a female caller and more than one person is with her, possibly. Quote, she got a call from him, unquote. And then another quote, they don't want to, they, I'll repeat that again, they don't want to touch him, unquote. But why would someone call Jennifer, Jennifer, from Donnie's phone, and vice versa, if Jennifer was with Wendy? And some of those calls are even happening at the same time 911 is being called. It doesn't make sense unless... It's someone trying to conceal the fact that they're there. Using Donnie's phone was a means to do that. Yet they didn't want to touch him to render aid. Mindy also called Donnie's phone around 2.15. Mindy is Wendy's twin sister, in case you've forgotten with everything else that's going on. But whoever was using Donnie's phone to talk with Jennifer sent Mindy's call to voicemail. As if the calls from Donnie's phone aren't sketchy enough, Wendy also deleted several texts from Donnie's phone. We were also told that later she figured out the passcode to Brittany's voicemail and deleted several minutes of voicemails, too. All before the police had a chance to either hear or see any of that, apparently. The more I think about it, the more I wonder if Donnie's phone was even in his SUV. Yeah. I mean, who in their right mind thinks that this is the perfect opportunity to go digging for a phone? Unless there is just some seriously damning evidence that you need to get rid of. I'm not even sure that most people would be able to get past what they're seeing in front of them. But aside from that, it makes you wonder where in Donnie's SUV his phone was sitting. Was it in the passenger seat? Was it in the floorboard? Was it in his lap? Was there blood on it? Or did she have the phone out of his uh, possession before this all happened? Right. There's a thought there. (laughs) You know, and that makes a lot of sense because again going back to the 911 call where they're not even willing to touch him when they call 911 there's literally that comment that says they don't want to touch him right but yet they want to go into an SUV to get a phone and then if that's not enough they use that phone to make phone calls right <laughs> So not even just figuring out what's going on with that, but they're putting that thing up to their head and making phone calls. And then here you've got law enforcement who up to this point in time had planned, according to the records, according to Eric Winberg, to meet Donnie to arrest him that day related to the child sex abuse investigation. Yet... Wendy walks away with this cell phone and takes it to Florida and back. I mean, who knows, really, whenever law enforcement did finally actually review it. But did nobody think while they're over here, they've towed the tow truck, I mean, towed the SUV to Robertsdale for impound. They've put the evidence that they've pulled out into the storage locker and nobody thought, hey, What happened to his phone? You know, she did call Eric Wimberg and say that he called her. They knew he had a phone and nobody thought, oh, crap, we don't have this phone. Or did they see these other phones that they've logged in there and think, oh, that's probably them. And on top of all that, if they knew Donnie was involved in the sex ring things that... Um, they had to know that Wendy was involved as well. I can guarantee that she was already under investigation. So she's standing there, a party to this incident, 
And she also has a cell phone in her hand. They may not know whose it is, but she's actively using it at the scene. So why would they let her leave with that? (laughs) It just blows my mind. I mean, at what point did they realize, oh, wait, we don't actually have it. We don't actually have the phone that he was using. Right. We've got phones here, but they're essentially burner phones. Where's the one that he was making the calls supposedly from? Or obviously he was making them from because we have the cell phone records. But, you know, the one that she claims that he called her at one from when he didn't. We know he didn't make that call. But I'm mind blown. Like that she just is allowed to walk away. There are no words. That's just, yeah. We could go on and on about this, I think. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Interestingly, the 911 notes initially indicate that Donnie was found at the end of River Park Road, but BCSO updates the 911 dispatch that it is possibly River Road and confirms later that BCSO is on the scene at the end of River Road. So now we know where he is. Which was kind of questionable because it didn't really jive with the map that was shown in the docuseries. For one, that map wasn't really accurate. And it's hard to tell because there's not any street names on it. But if you pause that, I know. That's a lot. But we've watched this several times. If you look at that map side by side with a Google map of where Donnie was located, you can kind of tell that the geographical area and the outline of the roads or the map of the roads, layout of the roads, they don't really match. Um, River Road is a dead-end street that runs next to Fish River. Right. And Karen Court is just a smidge over a mile directly across Fish River, which means Donnie would have been sitting at the end of River Road to ping off that tower. And, you know, Donnie started pinging off that Karen Court tower right after he left that the Moore's residence, that area around the Moore's house. So River Road isn't as secluded from Donnie and Wendy's regular home as we thought. In fact, one would have to drive right past Bay Street to even get to River Road, which means passing by the Hollands family home. Neither of which, according to Google Maps, are 45 minutes away from Jennifer's Magnolia Springs home. They're actually just 10 miles from Jennifer's home, making travel time maybe a little over 15 minutes, definitely less than 20 minutes for sure. Another interesting thing is that there's a screenshot of a post from Mindy that we've seen floating around, and it says, Wendy found Donnie about an hour and a half after he dropped her off at Jennifer's. Looking at the records, we know that Donnie was around Jennifer and Will Moore's house, but, you know, between 1045 and 1055, which means an hour and a half later is 12 to 1215-ish. If we believe that's true, and honestly, that's pretty specific and correlates with some other information we have but haven't been able to verify yet, I think it's probably more true than a lot of things we've read on social media. Then Wendy actually found Donnie not long after he stopped making phone calls. That would be also about the time Fairhope PD entered their incident report for a possible suicide on County Road 32 which is actually a road that you have to take to get to the Holland home and obviously, again, River Road. So we've got Mindy saying Wendy found Donnie about an hour and a half or so after he dropped her off at Jennifer's, a little before 11. We've got Fairhope entering an incident report at 12.02. We've got a bolo going out somewhere around the same time. And then we've got no activity on Donnie's phone from 1141 to 215, meaning 
There's no outgoing texts, no outgoing phone calls, and he's not answering any incoming calls. Right. And then we've got a document that's never been discussed before. And I think it helps show just how convoluted these stories are. It's the narrative from the Escambia County Medical Examiner's Office. It says, On 6 one at approximately 1,300 hours, or 1 p.m., the decedent, that's Donnie Holland, reportedly called his wife, Wendy, and told her that he was not going to an interview with BCSO and that he was going to, quote, jump off a bridge. According to BCSO, the decedent was a suspect in child sexual abuse case and had an appointment at 1400 hours or 2 p.m. with investigators. At approximately 1350 hours or 150 p.m., the decedent spoke to his wife again on the phone and told her he was coming home. When the decedent did not show up, the decedent's wife went to look for him. Now, if you didn't catch that, we've just talked about the fact that there's absolutely no outgoing calls from Donnie during that period. So apparently she just made that time up or someone did. And can I just point out that Wendy said he was coming home, but didn't. And that's when she went to look for him. She didn't say Jennifer's. She said home. She also didn't say she was already out looking for him. She implied she was at their home and he wasn't. She left their home when he didn't return to go look for him. So to make that even more questionable, again, how can it be? <laughs> Winberg know, says, right? <laughs> yeah. Winberg says in the series that Donnie took his life about 30 minutes before he was scheduled to meet BCSO, and he thought it was because Donnie knew he was going to be arrested. Again, that's 30 minutes before he was supposed to meet BCSO. And Winberg didn't give a time frame for that meeting, but the narrative did, and that was at 2 p.m. So if that time frame is accurate and Winberg is to be believed— then Donnie was actually shot around 1.30. And again, there's no way he could have called Wendy at 1.50 to say he was going home or anywhere else. But then how did Winberg know Donnie had been shot at 1.30? If 911 hadn't got a call yet, then based on the current story, no one would have or should have been able to be with Donnie at 1.30 to know that. Now, whether the records we've seen are wrong, as in there's a typo or somebody took, you know, the notes down wrong and the meeting was actually scheduled for 2.30 or Winberg mixed up the times when relaying them or he slipped up big time is unknown. But that also doesn't really account for the fact that Mindy said Wendy found Donnie an hour and a half after he dropped her off at Jennifer's. This is all a lot to follow. We know. We understand how crazy all of this is. And, you know, if the narrative's right, then it looks like somebody was trying to cover it up. Yeah. Hmm. You know, they call... 911 significantly after the fact. And let's be honest, from the documentation, that's exactly what it looks like happened. It sure does. But that's just speculation, guys. It's just looking at the documents. We don't know. But, I mean, I think it's questionable, at least. But let's be honest. There's so much here that does not make sense. Like, why are all these people calling the people who are supposedly their alibi? Did BCSO or Mobile Police Department, who ended up with the investigation, ever question that? Well, not the investigation of Donnie's death. Mobile Police Department ultimately ended up with the investigation into Brittany's disappearance. But probably not, because by the time BCSO arrived on the scene, 
Jennifer and Wendy who are there, according to their notes. Maybe mm. that call to Jennifer was the signal to get over there fast. Huh. Now, whether or not I believe Donnie shot himself, I honestly don't know. I do know I don't think he was alone when it happened. But if Donnie used Brittany's gun, then I'd venture to say he had more than just an inkling she wasn't okay. And maybe all of those calls and texts after the 27th were guilt. There's been a lot of speculation about the location of the gunshot wound also, and the fact that a bullet was lodged in his jaw. There was even mention in the series that had the bullet been removed, authorities would have known it didn't match Brittany's gun. But I think there's some confusion there. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood that, but based on the description in the series, It sounded like the actual gunshot wound was somewhere behind the ear with a downward trajectory, which is what caused the bullet to get lodged in Donnie's jaw. Right. That's how I understood it, too. But the autopsy report reads quite differently. According to the report, the entry wound was approximately three inches from the top of the head, centered directly above the middle of the ear, and had an upward trajectory, which, if... If you talk to any person who's been around these kinds of um, these kinds of injuries before, they'll tell you that's a little bit more consistent. Um, that the behind the ear thing is not so consistent with what stories they know. The BCSO records, you know, also say that Donnie was observed laying back in the driver's seat, and that there was another vehicle park directly beside the Suburban, which is what Donnie drove, facing the same direction, almost window to window, and that it was only a couple of feet away. So very close. It was close enough that the officer that wrote the narrative felt need to put a pretty good description in there. Going back to your comment on the autopsy report, There was no mention of the bottom jaw at all in the report or that any bullet or bullet fragments remained. In fact, the autopsy reports removing the bullet fragments from the left parietal lobe of Donnie's brain. Those fragments were later sent to the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences, which actually notes receiving multiple items from BCSO, including a vial labeled, in part, Holland Donald Projectile, which contained one white gauze labeled in part Holland Donald Brain containing one fired metal bullet jacket fragment and two lead fragments, mm-hmm. which means that the bullet was not actually lodged in Donnie's jaw, nor was it left in there. They also said the fragments were consistent with the type of ammunition used in the Raven handgun that was purported to belong to Brittany. Not so shockingly, the only other item of Brittany's found from the night she disappeared was purportedly her cell phone battery, and it was also in Donnie's SUV. It was discussed in the series that Wendy found the battery in the SUV after Fairhope PD released the SUV, but I'm not sure Fairhope ever actually had custody of it. I'm not sure that they did either, but if that's true, how did they end up with it and why? I mean, according to the BCSO records, Winberg followed the tow truck to the BCSO in Robertsdale, where it was stored along with any of the evidence collected. My understanding is BCSO handled the investigation into Donnie's death primarily because they had the pending criminal investigation, which is also something, by the way, that Chessie says she had no knowledge of until after the fact. But if you think about the things that were said in the series... And really look at the timeline. I mean, really look at it. How is that possible? I wondered about that, too. I mean, in the first episode, Winberg says he interviewed Donnie on several occasions in person and on the telephone, and that Donnie had failed a polygraph. To be fair, Winberg participated in the documentary on his own accord. It was stated in the beginning that neither BCSO or MPD participated. So there could have been some self-serving motives for Winberg, 
agreeing to be interviewed, especially since he'd been criticized for the work he'd done on the investigation. Exactly. So maybe set aside his statements for just a minute. Chessie herself said that her brother Scott was the one that blew the case wide open. Scott had been living in a different state and needed a place to live when he took a job here. So he moved in with Wendy and Donnie. While he was living with them, he reportedly began noticing things going on, such as discovered a sexually explicit message on Donnie's daughter's computer. The same daughter that messaged Brittany on Facebook, I believe. I think so. Jesse stated that Scott went to the police with this information, which happened in February of 2012, according to the series. This was obviously reported to BCSO because Winberg was assigned to that investigation in March. Then I guess Winberg starts looking into it pretty quickly if he's able to talk to Donnie on multiple occasions. And, you know, I had to rewind and listen to this a couple of times to make sure I heard it right. But it said that Scott called Chessie and told her the police were coming over and he needed somewhere to live. So she invited him to come stay at her house. And then she said, for, quote, three days and nights, we sat in my living room without sleeping, eating, or anything. While Scott told her everything he'd found and that he'd been playing detective for months. There's not a date or time on when that occurred, but that had to be around the time that Scott filed the report. Right. So if that occurred in February or even March after Winberg was assigned, then there's no way she learned about what was going on after Brittany's disappearance. And if you go back to the messages between Brittany and her cousin that we discussed in part one of episode one, Brittany had some idea of what was going on before receiving the message from her cousin. Because Brittany's response to the first message was, tell me what's going on. I don't know what's true and what you said. So either someone had talked to Brittany or Brittany had overheard some conversations. She had an idea about the allegations. And she was just trying to figure out, sounds like, whether or not they were true, what her cousin had said, and maybe to what extent people were involved. Right. Hmm. Perhaps there were certain things Chessie didn't know, but I'm not at all sure I believe that she didn't know there was an investigation, especially with the way that she describes the relationship with Brittany. It seems like a big thing to have been kept a secret, and factor in that she obviously talked to Scott about it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that nothing about Brittany's disappearance and Donnie's death, to be frank, is clear. Now, after Donnie's death and after the public became aware of the child sex abuse investigation, Brittany's disappearance began to take a backseat. The arrest and subsequent trials stayed in headlines over the next couple of years, and many, including her family, remained hopeful the information related to Brittany's whereabouts would come to light during the trials. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. According to the documentary, it would be almost two years before a search occurred on the actual Sticks River property. Ray Mooney with Class Kids stated they were the first to search the actual property in January of 2014. It appears the general area surrounding that property was searched, or was at least in the process of being searched. But once the investigators learned the last ping actually occurred in Grand Bay for Brittany, they basically decided that meant Brittany had not stayed in Baldwin County, and the focus shifted to Mobile County. Hmm. Over the past 10 years, numerous searches in various areas have taken place, but none of those searches have led to Brittany being found or uncovering any other information about what happened to her. Once the trials were over, news stories took over headlines and Brittany's disappearance quickly and quietly slipped into the background. It's sad to say, but it's not surprising that Brittany still hasn't been found over 10 years later. When you look back through the interviews and articles and documents, they all have conflicting dates, times, and recollections. 
I think it would be overwhelming for any investigating agency taking it on, especially if it's had as many detectives as her case seems to have. I mean, think about everything that we've went over and how confusing it is if you haven't really looked at it as much as what we have. It's not something you can just sit down and look at and automatically get it. It doesn't mean they shouldn't look at it, though. Exactly. Brittany still has family that loves her and a daughter that's growing up without a mother. I miss her. They deserve answers, and they deserve to bring her home. Brittany needs and deserves to be brought home. Mama, I love you. If you or someone you know has any information on the disappearance of Brittany Wood, we urge you to contact Mobile Police Department at 251-208-7211. You may also message Alabama Cold Case Advocacy on Facebook or send us an email at alcoldcaseadvocacy at gmail.com. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Anchor FM, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy, artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening to Unforgotten.